right, dear viewers, uh, welcome to Consensus Network. We're uh, back in business doing English content again. So it's, it's been a while, but thanks for hanging on if you're still uh, following the channel. And if you're, you're not following the channel, you can, you can do so again. Um, there's going to be uh, plenty of more uh, English videos. And we're going to kick off with, a, with an interesting guest, Juraj, from, uh, from Hackers Congress from Parallel Police. And we're going to be talking about that event, which is uh, on the coming weekend. Um, we have a, a very special discount code for you. So you want to hang on to the end of the video uh, to check that out and take advantage of it. Uh, we're going to be talking today a little bit about paying with Bitcoin, like uh, salaries and stuff, doing business with that, doing trade with that, uh, Bitcoin circular economy, how to maybe um, deal with your accounting and your, your liabilities, all, all that kind of stuff. And we'll see well, where this journey takes us. But without further ado, I will let the guests uh, introduce themselves. Yuraz, welcome to Consensus Network. Uh, please introduce yourself. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself and we'll just ease into it. Thanks, Nico. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm uh, 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 a founder of Parallel Police and Institute of Crypto Anarchy, which are um, places, uh, uh, currently more than one. The first one was in Prague, where the Congress is happening as well. Uh, but there are uh, places uh, and uh, organizations of the same name in Vienna and Bratislava uh, and Kosice. Um, and um, me personally, I have a background in uh, computer security and um, uh, algorithms. I studied computer science. And when I first uh, read the Bitcoin white paper, I, I realized that it's a very nice algorithm. I didn't, back then I didn't know if it could work as money. So I asked my friend who is an uh, economist of Austrian uh, School of Economy, which is the only real economy, I think, <laughs> uh, if this could work as money. So I was explaining it to him for, uh, for uh, a few hours. And then he said, probably not, but it is in interesting. Now he, he's or also changed his mind. Um, and with this place, Parallel Police, what we try to do is we uh, tried to create uh, a parallel society. Um, and that means parallel education, parallel financial system. We use, uh, for example, only creative com commons music. We, uh, there is usually in parallel police, there is usually cafeteria, co-working space. Institute of Crypto Anarchy is a studio think tank and we do talks and, and stuff like that. And what we tried to do um, when we started uh, more than six years ago um, was uh, that we uh, tried to figure out if we can use these parallel solutions to run an organization. So we said, okay, we are going to be Bitcoin only. And that was, uh, you know, the time when uh, there were like uh, two wallets in the app stores and uh, uh, several people even paid with their Bitcoin core running on their notebook by, by scanning QR codes <laughs> with the camera. So very, very early days. And uh, we tried to figure out if we can actually do this, if we can say, uh, okay, we are not using any kind of fiat currencies um, with one exception that uh, we allow um, uh, an operator of uh, Bitcoin ATM to have an ATM there for people to be able to buy Bitcoin with fiat. So that's the only use of fiat in, in these spaces. And we were experimenting and uh, um, we had, um, uh, we went through all the, all the problems of Bitcoin and uh, um, uh, it was a very interesting experience. We went through the high fees where people would pay, you know, uh, three times the amount of espresso for, for a fee. And <laughs> then we would need to explain it. And uh, then uh, things like uh, wallets not syncing and uh, incoming payment not confirming. So the first wallets, for example, couldn't spend unconfirmed uh, input. So if the block was 
was not mined for you know 30 minutes people were waiting to pay for their espresso <laughs> uh, in the cafeteria so it was very very interesting experience and um it, it was i like that we started way before the crazy hodl bitcoin millionaires and uh, to the moon craze uh, this was really enthusiasts and and people who um who wanted to try something new so uh, so it was very different crowd back then uh, and i also also what is really interesting is to uh, to see how the community is changing and uh, the diversity of people that uh, that are attracted to freedom uh, first of all uh, and we think that being uh, crypto only is a good filter if if people are not willing to cross this uh, barrier and this artificial barrier that we put in front of them they probably are not ready and we don't hate them but uh, they're not a good fit for for our organization so that's uh, that's my experience i'm uh, uh, i started the uh, the prague space but uh, because i live in bratislava uh i wanted to have something closer to home not a three hour train ride so i also started uh, a similar space here in bratislava so that's a bit about me <laughs> that's really interesting thank you uh for sharing and definitely thank you for telling us about those like i i like those kind of like uh collective co-working spaces and you know basically hobbies what i really liked uh, about your stories, you know, the, the early days, right? When it's just the enthusiast, it's no, there's no moon boys. There's no, you know, like in it for tech, whatever. Uh, everybody's just doing it because it's so fun and interesting. Like it, it reminds me of the time. Uh, I've always been a huge nerd myself and always into the, you know, the latest uh, tech, no matter how difficult it was. Like back in when the internet started to be more popular, like in the end of the 90s, uh, beginning of 2000s. Uh, I was on the computer like all the time, you know, doing photoshopping and, and making web pages and stuff like that. Everybody would be like, you know, stop wasting your time and do something productive with your life. And it was so difficult to, you know, to try to like download music uh, in the early days, like, uh, you know, around the time when Napster was a thing or, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, Eric is still quite uh, popular, but at that time, uh, that's when I got into it. Um, all kinds of like peer-to-peer -peer software uh, piracy obviously was was a huge pull for me um, because suddenly I could actually acquire stuff that I normally have to pay money for using my own tools of information age like it was mind-blowing to me like it was like and I was like I can't believe nobody else is into it because it was not the not the norm back then it was like uh, it was really weird to think this way. I don't think it's so much anymore. Like now everybody has a smartphone. Everybody is using, um, you know, online tools. But yeah, I was, uh, yeah. I was just reminiscing that when you, when you, when you were mentioned the early days, the hobbies days, uh, good times. It is um, what I, what I uh, like to tell people uh, when they ask me why I'm into crypto. Uh, it is, you know, that, um, in this time, it is a completely new world that is being crea created in front of our own eyes. And um, I think in maybe 10 years, it will be completely boring. It will be like uh, now if you, re if you wanted to do an e-shop e -shop with pet food. Uh, but as you said, uh, like if the year was 2000, I wouldn't be doing anything else but, a, but an e-shop uh, with pet food because that was the thing that was exciting back then and it was we were creating internet so you know we could uh, we could have a huge impact right in front of our eyes and i think this is the time for crypto especially after the bear market which filtered out you know all the uh, crazy ico projects uh, you know promising stuff and now uh, the people who stayed, uh, I think, are there for uh, either for hard money, but also for for this fact that you can you can really participate in creating a parallel financial system. It's uh, uh, it's very exciting. 
Yeah, and and uh, you know we were creating internet at that time and and social media and stuff. You know, it was so weird to be into that at that time. And now it is the norm. It's weird if you're not in social media, if you're not using Facebook. It's like what's weird with you? Uh, what's uh, what's wrong with you? And now I feel like we are creating the internet of money, like um, you know Bitcoin and and uh, possibly other cryptos as well. Um, it's just so interesting to see and already to experience and feel where it can go because you will you feel already much more sovereign just like uh back in the day when you were or started ordering stuff online for the first time and the world really start to open up and now it's even more so because you can have suddenly have these collectives these global collectives that that cooperate and form companies not necessarily on paper but in, you know, in real true spirit and, and uh, with the skin in the game and, you know, make things happen together using this uh, global money system that is unstoppable and uh, unnegotiable um, in, in settlement. So really interesting. And I, I really think this is the last piece of the holy grail of the internet that was, you know, promised to us when, when internet started to be a thing, you know, like uh, we, we can do free commerce with everybody. And it was, has not quite been that because all the uh, payments have been processed by, by uh, centralized companies. And it's not really, you can't really buy, you know, like, if somebody is 3D printing guns, for example, and selling those, I, I don't think that's going to be possible without, without cryptography and, and these yes. kind of tools that we now have. And, you know, throw in the 3D printing and, and um, you know, Bitcoin uh, with the internet and Tor and everything. It's, it's just uh, mind boggling to see how free and how individual we can be. Because I, I, I believe per, personally that individuals will be able to provide every single piece of uh, product or, or service more efficiently, more cost effective and, and, and with a better service than the bigger corporations that now rule the world. What do you yes, think? Yes, I, I, I agree totally. By the way, uh, when we started Parallel Police in the basement, we had a 3D printing studio. And one of the things that uh, were kind of shocking when you entered the space, uh, so so... Uh, from the outside, it looks like a hipster cafeteria, but when you enter there, there's 3D printed stuff, you know, weird money, weird music, because we only use creative commons and so on. Um, and, uh, but what you don't see, uh, and what is also important for this, uh, that you said that uh, products and services will be provided by individuals, is the parallel community. And uh, I think that is a crucial part of uh, of the future i think that our relationships uh, uh, i mean business relationships will be more peer-to-peer -peer or uh, paul rosenberg uh, likes to call it uh, note first relationships so for example uh, when uh, uh, when I wrote my book, in uh, it's in Slovak, so unfortunately you would not understand it. But the way that we we were uh, doing it is, I found uh, people from within the community. Uh, we knew that we shared values, so there's no need to like we have an understanding that disputes are handled within community, not through the state courts. We have understanding that we pay each other in Bitcoin. We have uh, you know, it is very easy to negotiate the uh, the uh, uh, conditions, the terms uh, of a contract if you have a community where people know each other. So I found an editor, I found a graphics de uh, graphic designer, and together we were we were able to create this. And it's um, it's basically a virtual company. Uh, created just for the book. So it's not a uh, DAO, we didn't need a token or anything, but it's done within a community. And this community uh, lowers transaction costs because we can find each other. We have a mutual understanding of values already. Um, we have a way to handle disputes because everyone wants to be part of this community. So it's not possible if you... Um, if you don't talk to a person or something, you need to solve any kind of disputes. Thankfully, there were not many disputes, but um, but this also lowers transaction costs. We have this completely parallel structure, and um, 
and uh, it's not hierarchical. I'm I'm not anyone's boss, you know. I I give my part of the work, which was the text. Uh, uh, the editor uh, supplies the edited text. The graphic designer uh, gives me the PDF, and then we print it. Uh, so, uh, so I think this is uh, uh, part of our future, and this can this all happens in parallel. There is no state in, involved whatsoever. Uh, they, you know, it's uh, totally in the in the crypto anarchic sense. It's hidden from. Uh, from the outside world because it's uh, just peer-to-peer -peer relationships. That sounds really great. Actually, that's uh, a lot like uh, what I have with, with my company, even though uh, my company is an actual company, but it's only, uh, it's only me and it's only for the purposes of satisfying certain needs. Like when you need a license for a book, you know, we publish books, so we need to acquire those licenses. So we need a um, corporate body for that. But other than that, is completely just like you said, uh, we call it the Starfish organization. Uh, if you haven't read a book called The Starfish and the Spider, it's really good. Uh, the mm -hmm. Unstoppable Power of Decentralized Organizations. And it's just like you said, like everybody has like our spaces in, in the internet, you know, Telegram, Twitter. Uh, that's how we organize ourselves. And um, everybody can leave and, and come and go as they please. So everybody uh, chooses to work together for a common cause uh, because they want to, not necessarily that they expect to get compensated. Of course, that's the hope for everybody. You know, we want uh, Bitcoin and, and, uh, and uh, you know, these uh, books and, and teaching people to pay off uh, in the long run in one way or another. But that's not the main goal here. The main goal is here to just do something that we're really into. And I found personally, like, like we, we've been translating the, the Bitcoin standard to quite a few languages, including the uh, a Czech, uh, Dutch, Portuguese, Finnish, and we're doing a Hebrew one as well. And all of these projects have something in common. They have this team of uh, volunteer translators. So we don't have any, uh, I mean, some of them are professionals also by trade, uh, but that's not the point. That's, that's not why they came in to get a, per word, you know, fee for their work Yeah. for two reasons, for budget reasons, obviously. And the second thing is, I truly think that we get a better product with the enthusiastic who have the full incentive to deliver the best possible uh, interpretation and translation of the work uh, because they want to yes. give it to their parents. So, so that, yes. that has been like the, the wonderful thing to see this, all these Bitcoiners like working so hard and, um, you know, not basically asking anything except they want really to get the knowledge out there. And then, of course, if, uh, if we are successful and we can make some profit, then everybody wins even more uh, and get some sets. So, so that's the hope, of course. Yeah, yeah. We, we call that uh, Starfish Organization. Nice, nice. Thanks for the recommendation for the book. I will check it out. And what is also interesting, if you do it like this, um, uh, so if everyone is there voluntarily because this is what they want to do, uh, they're doing uh, everything in their unique ability. Because if you have a hierarchical organization, you have a boss and uh, they will come to you and they will tell you, okay, you need to do this. And you didn't choose it, so you're not great at it. You know, you're, you will do it because your boss told you to and you know you need to work eight hours a day. But then you're not... Uh, utilizing your unique abilities and you're you're doing something that you're not good at so this is why i think that this kind of star uh, organizations uh, will uh, probably outcompete uh, the old hierarchical organizations because they're just better everyone is doing what the, what they're great at and what they really want to do yeah that's a good points I, I would say um there is a place for spider organizations, which are like centralized organizations. Like if you want to, for example, if you want to make a production car, then uh, probably you want to centralize the, the factory and the supply lines and, and have full control of making that product. It's very possible that you get a better product that way. That's very specific uh, case. But what I would say is this is a way, way stronger if you want to build a long-term business. 
I think you mm-hmm. can't do any better than uh, than to have a starfish organization that is organically growing and also, also organically dying if there suddenly is no more demand for the product that you are supplying. And that's okay. That's yes. like that's how the nature works. Um, I have another book recommendation for yeah. you, which is Seven Day Weekend by Ricardo Semler. Right. Um, he's running uh, a factory uh, on a kind of voluntarist principle. It's not uh, totally not, not first, but he was uh, saying exactly this. Uh, for example, uh, so they have a they have a manufacturing line. So there need to be people, you know, at the same time uh, um, because uh, the results of one's work go in the pipeline and. The next guy uh, uh, needs the the input from the from the previous guy, but for example, he said that uh, uh, they don't have a specified working hours. They uh, he said when the team agrees to do the work, they do the work. It's up to them, and um, uh, he he basically said that uh, for example, you studied to be a doctor, you have an expertise in being a doctor, and uh, Uh, now you and imagine you are working in a voluntary hospital where you can come and go. So uh, you're, let's say, uh, you're an uh, you're a surgeon, um, and you don't feel like going to work. Are you, you know, do you leave your team uh, standing there and looking at the dying patient just because you feel like sitting in a couch? No, of course you go to work. So. Uh, so you don't need a boss to tell you that you need to do your job because uh, that's uh, that's your unique ability. That's what what you're uh, here in this world to do. And if you if you don't, you should do something else. So uh, so maybe I w- I wouldn't rule out even care manufa- car manufacturers, um, but uh, of course it's easier to organize. Yeah, there's mostly robotics nowadays anyway, not so many people, I guess. So I, I guess um, it's easier to find people who are committed to maintaining uh, machinery or, or programming it or something like that. But yeah, basically the choosing part is, is the part that uh, we should focus on. If, if you want to uh, really find a long-term employees, they need to have the same goals as, as your company has. And I don't think it's too hard to find nowadays because of the information age tools. Like back in the day, it was difficult to make a niche business work. But now, basically, all you need is like 30 to 60,000 loyal followers and you have a business that can be very successful and successful enough to, you know, perhaps support you entirely. So the possibilities in this world based on, you know, to choose what we want to do are... are, uh, so much more vast than like let's say 20 years or even 10 years ago and i don't think a lot of people have realized this i think a lot of people are going the old uh you know beaten path uh to the to the brick and mortar institute uh, uh, institutional brainwashing uh, um, schools and pay their pay for uh, a lot of countries most people have to pay vast amounts and take loans to attend these institutions so that they can get a piece of paper and then get employed. That's like, and, and before you're, uh, you can start working, you're already uh, in the hole for your time, at least five to five to 10 years, depending on what you studied. And uh, not to mention also you're, you're uh, in debt, uh, in monetary debt. So you're in debt with time and, and you're, you're so far back. Uh, whereas if you just simply started learning the thing that, really drives you, really motivates you, really interests you from the day, from day one. Like for example, for me, it was the internet and computers, but I was so brainwashed by the system. So I, I still pursued uh, a career in construction engineering, which I did for, for, for 10 years, but I could have just well stick with my real passion and, you know, uh, kind of like, I'm not, not to say that I'm not grateful for the 10 years of, of career that it taught me a lot of project management and stuff. I was really good. 
I'm just saying that at that time, it was the right impulse to be into those uh, internet things. That was the, the future. So I could have chosen a different way. And I think the same applies right now. I, I think we, we should stop looking back for answers and stop lo- um, you know, taking risks and really listening to ourselves because it's always going to be worth it, especially for young people. You, know? you have time to fail and lose everything multiple times uh, you know, before you really have to start taking things seriously. So, you know, I don't know what people are exactly. so afraid of. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, one, one more thing I wanted to say about the, you know, our process in the, in the translation, like uh, choosing things for yourself. How we start a project is, is we have this contribution sheet that has all the work uh, split into pieces. And then we have like what we call passes, uh, four different passes. So we have the raw translation, we have the... Um, uh, proofreading and, and general review. And then we have editing, well, which is the mm-hmm. final part. Uh, so everybody can choose. Uh, the, the, there's a sheet and, and you can basically put your name to all the slots that interest you. Maybe you're good. Maybe you're, uh, some people are really good at, you know, really quickly putting the main idea on paper, you know, converting it into the, in their head and then it's just done. And that's great raw translation. I can't do that well because I'm more like a micromanager. So then that, that mm-hmm. results in people just picking those parts that they feel like they are confident with and, and uh, want to do those. And every time mm-hmm. we do that, it's just like, it naturally goes like there's no problem of management. Not really because everybody's a self manager because everybody's clear about as long as we are, uh, everybody knows that when, when is this book uh, supposed to be out? Uh, that's pretty much the only, only information you need. And then the, the team will just carry itself. It's a beautiful thing to follow. And also you have, um, uh, and I don't think that many people appreciate it or it's, it's um, become so ordinary for us, but uh, in the, in, in the internet age, we have a, uh, absolutely amazing collaboration tools you know like just being able to edit a single document you know people from all around the world uh, working on the same text uh, in in real time uh, uh, what you can also do if you have a, if you have a budget uh, um, uh, that is uh, handled by uh, let's say a small team like this virtual company Uh, usually it is you know you create a new account in trezor and you 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 fund it and then uh, there are rules how to spend it uh, and you don't need to go to a bank you know to create a sub account or anything like that you know everything is just few clicks away collaboration asynchronous there are no no need for meetings there's like Uh, you write a message the, uh, or, or I really like voice messages. The other party can listen to it whenever they feel like. If they're in a different time zone, the time zone they, uh, they wake up and they listen to it when they have time. And uh, it uh, became uh, much more efficient to do things. And uh, now it is very easy to telecommute. Like in the 90s, it was like okay emails and you would uh, you know agree on time to call and the collaboration it was it was not um, uh, not as good as it is now and uh, we got so used to it that we don't even notice that this is so easy and it's happening uh, and uh, and i i think it's fantastic and uh, and it's getting better every day and also uh, uh, the the price of uh, all these tools went down uh, like you don't even need to buy an an office program um, you know uh, you have an ai machine translation you know even if i want to translate uh, an article i first use google translate and then ju- then just fix it <laughs> you know <laughs> and and the translation is really good like i'm i'm surprised if it's uh, um If it's too scientific language, it's not not as good. But for for many uh, articles, you can uh, uh, basically Google Translate is my colleague, <laughs> or any other DeepL or any other uh, translation service. So so now we have this. Um, I don't really like the word AI, but these software colleagues. You know, you don't need a secretary because the calendar handles everything for you. Uh, it already knows when you're busy and when you're not. So, so uh, I'm grateful for these things, and uh, I don't think that people 
appreciate it because it's became it's, it became so ordinary that we just don't notice that. You know, it, that's that's a really good point. And and what makes me sad is that I think most people use internet mostly for ent- entertainment. And uh, to some people, it's the extent of, of their internet use, you know, social media, uh, jokes, Netflix, Spotify, and that's it. Even though you have basically everything that has ever been written available <laughs> to you with few clicks, if you're just into that and you could just teach yourself any profession, basically almost any profession or, you know, um, yeah, the, the amount of information is just so staggering. You and you're so right. You get used to it. Like I'm, I'm uh, old enough to remember the time that we went to library for information, and then you will find a book that is yes. perhaps ten years old, and you have no idea yeah. if it's current information in any capacity. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we are spoiled by the information culture for sure. Yes. Yes. So. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the Hackers Congress that is on, over this weekend? Sure, sure. So uh, I think it's a very unique event. It's very unlike any blockchain conference. It doesn't uh, uh, promote uh, any philosophy. So it's not a Bitcoin maximalist uh, um, conference. It's not a technological conference. Um, uh, what is basically the because the space itself is focused on freedom or liberty um, that's what uh, that's what the congress is about so we are talking about tools it's also about bitcoin about crypto uh, but uh, it's not about uh, uh, features technological features or investments uh, it's more about how to incorporate it uh, in your way of life, how to increase your uh, your liberty, your freedom. Um, so from technological, art, philosophical, scientific perspective. So um, it's a little bit more uh, fringe crypto anarchist, uh, futuristic conference, I would say. Um, what we did uh, differently this year uh, is that uh, because of the lockdowns and many countries have Czech Republic on the red list or black list. So uh, even for me, for example, if I would travel to Czech Republic, I would need to go uh, to self-quarantine. So uh, not many people uh, are able to come physically this year. So we are uh, streaming. Uh, there will be some uh, VR meetups as well. And what we are also doing is uh, that during the weekend, we will have a 24-7 uh, podcast stream that is free for everyone. And there uh, there will be interviews. Uh, I think there will be over 30 hosts that will be hosting interviews and so on. So, uh, and I'll that be is... one of them, by the way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> good, good. When is your time slot? I, I actually have, um, my first one is with, with PTC Paradigm or AKA Rafa, mm-hmm. uh, shout out to him. We, we're doing the um, 1 a.m. slot, I believe, uh, on Saturday. And then I have a slot, actually, I have the schedule right here. Yeah, so I have another slot with, uh, with Smuggler, also with Rafa, at 2 o'clock on Saturday. I'm wow. talking with Keto Miner, 3 o'clock, about Nodal and um, uh, BTC retail and the future of it. Uh, re, uh, sovereign but retail. He, also, or like that. he also has a talk about that, I think. So yes, I think the, so. Yes, I think it, it, it's going to be really nice to talk to him about it. Good. Yeah. And I'm also a Nodal user. And on Sunday, I'll have a talk with Hodlon out at two. So those are my slots. Good, good. I'll be Friday 5 p.m. and we will talk about projects that we are doing in Paralpolis Bratislava. So we are building a mesh network, uh, a citywide mesh network. We have found a way uh, to uh, simulate um, a wedding. So if you want to get married uh, and uh, you don't like the conditions by state, for example, you don't have the right gender balance or <laughs> or uh, the right number of people. Um, we have uh, consulted with uh, with uh, lawyers uh, on how to create uh, 
basically the same uh, thing as marriage, but uh, using private contracts. So that's uh, that's going to be interesting. So we will be presenting these uh, these kind of projects. Uh, not much crypto but uh, related to freedom and parallel solutions so parallel marriage is fun thing to do especially in a country where uh, there is only one way to get married <laughs> if you are man and woman so that will be my uh, my hcpp tv talk so you can uh, you can listen to this stream at uh, hcpp.tv uh, and again this this one is free um, and uh, the theme for this year is digital totality. I think we are entering this kind of digital totality. Uh, the COVID uh, uh, thing, I would say, just accelerated what is going on. But we had uh, totalitarian tendencies even before. Uh, last uh, few years, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia started uh, doing uh, total financial surveillance so for example uh, the cash registers uh, uh, in every retail store they have to upload uh, everything that is basically what is written on the receipt uh, to the central financial authority online and uh, if it's not sent online then it's illegal so someone in the financial authority has a database of all purchases so if you uh, go to a pharmacy and uh, you want to buy uh, uh, i don't know syphilis medicine suddenly uh, the financial authority has information about the date time location what exactly did you buy how much uh, did you pay for it what did you use to pay for it so if it's credit card or cash or things like this so I think so. So we were kind of uh, uh, seeing that this is happening. You know, mobile phone tracing, uh, AML, KYC, uh, the new EU uh, AML five, and so on. Um, so, so uh, censorship because uh, governments want to block uh, illegal gambling sites and so on. So they uh, they started uh, to they, they they started to introduce. Um, censorship infrastructure which is right now used to block illegal illegal gamb gambling but it can be used for anything once it's set up you know you can just uh, um, put uh, a different url on the list and and it's getting blocked and after the covid lockdowns we realized okay schengen is no longer happening there are border checks uh, between european country countries so this story is now false you know i i cannot just drive to prague i have to show my passport and uh, i get asked questions questions about where i was and uh, if i'm healthy and um, uh, and and this is happening um, in slovakia we had a leak of all the test results with uh, uh, of the covid test results with all the private data so more than three hundred thousand entries with names dates of births uh, 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 symptoms and the result of the test and so on so so we see that this is happening and i think the the the, the covid crisis accelerated it uh, and um and we are looking for ways how to how to live in this new world how to find better parallel solutions for more privacy for uh, actually being able to do what we want to do so so censorship resistance you know um, uh, being able to send money wherever we want to and and these things so i think the topic is very interesting uh, and uh, uh, again goes uh, much further much beyond the hodling and uh, uh avoiding inflation although that's important like uh, what what the european central bank and other central banks are doing is basically crime it's it's fraud uh but uh, but there are many more problems that uh, that are uh, coming i i would say very very fast and uh, it's it's not fun but uh because we are creative smart people we can get together and find a way what to do about it 
and it's not voting <laughs> it's uh, actually finding a parallel um parallel solution i think yeah vote with your feet and your money that's the only only way to do it correctly yeah, sure. and yeah like i'm a digital nomad so i can totally you know the the frustration um related to the covid especially now that it seems like uh, it's turning into more and more of a scam uh, to introduce more strict controls uh, to let people accept and condition them to you know kind of like step up the uh, um, the condition of the whole world you know like you said uh, shutting down borders inside the, the schengen area i think uh, it really doesn't uh, look good. And, and a lot of times when those uh, temporary measures tend to extend uh, indefinitely. So, you know, it's, uh, it's great that we have this option. But at the same time, I just wonder what kind of ugliness is going to come out before um, th th this is, is so-called over and we can, we can uh, safely transition to the second realm or something like that. Or do you think we can just kind of like do that anyway, regardless of what happens in the world. Because I think we are a little bit too dependent on everything, all the infrastructure. I think that, well, there are of course many layers. So uh, if there's a border control, you can go around. And I've uh, seen people from the community do that uh, because uh, we are doing projects together and sometimes when when uh, when the borders were closed uh, you know uh, the border is quite long so some people just drove to the forest and walked uh, through it in, uh, during midnight or at midnight and just went around uh, so that's one way to to uh, look at it uh, okay um, what does it mean the border is not closed the border is long and uh, the only thing that is closed is where the where the customs and cops are standing uh, but what i what i think uh, is and this is actually going to be my talk at hcpp is that uh, i think that the uh, general volatility uh, uh, in the world is going to increase and uh, there is a relationships between uh, relationship between freedom and optionality so optionality could be um, one way uh, to look at freedom if you have more options of what you can do but don't have to but you can decide that you can do it um, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, mind setup and kind of collecting these options in your life uh, actually make you anti-fragile in presence of volatility so what does it mean uh, practically so one of the options that i wanted to acquire that you also have because you're a digital nomad is that i wanted to work from anywhere i wanted to uh, so in order to get this option sometimes you need to change a job or or you need to do something to it so it's not a free option it's not given to you by uh, being born or anything like that it's something that you have to acquire so for for me it was i was uh, uh, because i'm an entrepreneur i had three companies all of them had an office it was one one big office and i was going to the office every day and uh, so so I had to, even though uh, I was a co-owner in these companies, they were limiting me and I had to go to the office because that's what, uh, where everything was happening. And then I made a con conscious de decision that I don't want to do that. Uh, and I want to have an option to work from anywhere. And uh, I uh, ended up selling uh, my shares in the companies and uh, I acquired this option. And now... Uh, this gives me freedom because now you know with with the covid thing uh, i didn't i didn't notice everything because i was working from home and i could work from home it was not a limitation it was not an exceptional situation for me so this option um, the use of this option should be basically free so you acquire it at some point and then you should be able to exercise it, exercise it whenever you want another option that i acquired uh, Okay, I, I bought uh, respirators and face masks in January where, like people said, okay, it's a Chinese virus. Um, so like two months before there was any kind of shortage. 
um, I also realized uh, at some point that maybe uh, uh, there would uh, there could be a problem in the future. I don't know when. I do, I'm. I'm never trying to predict what is going to happen. I'm just trying to set up my life uh, in a way that it works. So for example, what I did is I bought uh, solar panels because my living depends on my computer working and there could be an energy outage. And this is essential. This is not, you know, acquiring random, random options. If there is no el- electricity, I cannot work. I'm basically useless. So. Uh, so I bought them, but not because the energy is cheaper, because it's not. It's uh, especially in the in the area where I live, there's not so much sun, so so it's quite expensive electricity. But now I have the option. So when everyone is going to charge their their subsidized electric cars, and if the distribution network collapses, I have an option. I can even sell, sell the electricity if I want. So. Uh, all these options uh, do really well in volatile environment. So, uh, so what I suggest uh, is um, looking at things that are important in our lives and kind of uh, finding if we can increase uh, vo- uh, optionality in these uh, in these areas. So, that's my way of thinking. But uh, it's actually about thriving in volatility, not you know. Um, being afraid of what might happen or um uh or anything like that so uh i i got good training with using cryptocurrencies which are volatile so <laughs> so uh so that's how i got um um got to think about uh, volatility uh but that's uh that's what uh, my plan is so freedom and volatility and optionality and relationship between these concepts sounds really healthy and that's pretty much how i live my life as well you know like life is volatile nature is volatile things can change at a moment's notice especially in the market which is comprised of uh, countless individuals that be- uh, all behave from their unique needs and unique wants and everybody's unique so there's absolutely no possibility to predict the future so why even try like you said just try to make everything work the best way for you and keep improving that um yeah there, there's a saying like uh, he who fears not of losing anything can truly be free so i think that's the ultimate optionality that you are okay with the option of zero like you don't yes. have anything like you're naked in the dark alone and you have nothing and you're happy and that's enough. So yes. if you're cool with that option, then I think you can simply walk free. You know, uh, the things happen, shitty things happen in your life. You get depressed, but you get over it because you know that you have the, you know, your final yes. option is the zero. <laughs> and and yes. as long yes. as you, you're not there, you have something more than the zero. Uh, so you're doing actually better than your your so-called uh, plan B or plan C or plan Z. Uh, and yes. that's your last option. And you should be okay with that. Everybody should be okay yeah. with that option because it is an option. It's always on the table. Yes, exactly. And also, um, um, I think that the markets should be volatile in order to be useful because the price information, it's information. You know, so the uh, a banana in January shouldn't cost the same as a banana in August because <laughs> uh, there are seasons and there's uh, supply and demand and uh, actually uh, everything should be changing because uh, when uh, when everything is stable, then uh, it usually uh, means that someone is trying to uh, to force stuff into into stability and that usually backfires it's usually hidden risk or accumulated um, misinformation and so on so so uh, when i see volatility also in prices um, i'm uh, appreciating that uh, the the price discovery mechanism works and uh, and that uh, i can uh, i can relate to it and i can use it yeah i mean uh, the audacity of central planners like how how could you ever possibly 
think that you could outdo nature or you could outdo uh, the invisible hand of chaos that directs uh, you know the actions of humans which is completely out of anybody's uh, wildest imaginations uh, how how that kind of um, system might behave so even in the best case scenario you will be able to perform just as well as nature in in its own chaos from its own uh, standpoints that is the best case scenario and that is utopia you're never going to reach that but but of course the reason why this is being done is it's immensely profitable uh, to take the role of the king, to take the role of the god, and and make other people your subjects and make the other people work for you. So that's why it's being done. But it has nothing to do with efficiency. It has nothing to do with wealth or or creation. It's it's basically you're destroying something, taking something from uh, value from others and and to give it to some other people, uh, which is theft that's essentially. Why that's why we want to opt out <laughs> yeah exactly and now we have that chance <laughs> which is reason. which is fantastic which is uh our money changes so much and once we have that once we have the uh universal language of uh communicating value and communicating our wants without anybody being able to stop it in in any capacity i think that's just going to solve so many issues related to all kinds of human action it's really exciting yeah. times yeah exactly i think we should uh start directing this uh towards the end it has been uh, yeah. immensely fun conversation it didn't like like i said in the in the beginning like this never turn out the way you you plan i think we touched on quite a few of the points that we wanted to and most importantly we uh we talked about the hackers congress which again it is on this weekend so if you are around uh please check the option to get a ticket and uh, as promised we actually have a, a discount code uh, consensus with a K, uh, which I believe gives you 50% off the tickets, which is a very substantial amount. Do take advantage of it if you have a chance to go check uh, Parallel Police out uh, in, in Praha, in Czech Republic. Um, I would go if if I had the time. Unfortunately, I have to. I have a, a business to run, so uh, so I can't go this year. Hopefully, I can go next year. But if you can. Uh, please do take advantage of this offer and go and go and see these awesome uh, speakers. And if you can't, and then at least do come to the, uh, I, I believe Max Hillebrand said it was 58 hours uh, live stream, which has uh, 32 or something like that uh, hosts, myself and, and uh, Yuraj uh, included. So definitely check that out at least. Um, any final words? Where can people find you? That, that sort of stuff um, in an open invitation to everybody. Yes, uh, people can find me at hackyourself.io. Uh, I have a new podcast, uh, only four episodes so far. Uh, but uh, if you uh, liked uh, listening to me, then there's a little bit more. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, uh, hcpp.tv uh, will be the, the live stream that you mentioned. So uh, people... Uh, could check check this out i'm also on twitter j u r b e d is my handle so that's it and thank you for listening and thanks for having me thank you so much um i really enjoyed this and and yeah as as i said remember to use the code consensus if you're going uh to attend the live event uh, i would take advantage of that if i was you if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Telegram uh, with the tag Omnifin, double N at the end. Uh, it used to be different, but now it's both the same, so it's less confusing, hopefully. Um, get in touch if you want to do a show with me, if you want, uh, want to publish a book. Um, I, I do all kinds of Bitcoin works, including the CW21 uh, magazine, which has been a, a really interesting project as well, which I recommend to to check it out as well. And we're probably going to talk about it with Huddle and Out over the weekend if you're going to check the uh, uh, HCPP uh, TV. So thank you, viewers. Thank you, Gerard, for your time thank you. and excellent insight. Thank you for this wonderful event uh, that you're going to throw in. And, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the next one. Have a good yeah, one, everyone. Bye-bye.